My name is Julie Kaplan. I'm the manager of public programs at the Center for Jewish History. I'm happy to welcome you today to a book talk organized by the Center's Scholars Working Group, Hear Their Cry, Understanding the Jewish Orphan Experience. This is one of two programs that the group is presenting this month to conclude their two years at the Center. The Center for Jewish History is a home for the archival collections of five partner institutions, which together create the largest and most comprehensive archive of the modern Jewish experience outside Israel. If you logged on a little early, you may have seen our slideshow of upcoming programs. You can sign up for any of them at programs.cjh.org or just click the calendar link on our homepage. Let me briefly introduce our speakers. Bernice Lerner is a senior scholar at Boston University's Center for Character and Social Responsibility. She is the author of The Triumph of Wounded Souls, Seven Holocaust Survivors' Lives, and co-author of Happiness and Virtue Beyond East and West, Toward a New Global Responsibility. Today we're discussing her new book, All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, a British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen Belsen, in which she focuses on the life of her mother, Rachel Dinuth. Marlene Trestman is the author of Fair Labor Lawyer, The Remarkable Life of New Deal Attorney and Supreme Court Advocate Bessie Margolin, and is now writing Most Fortunate Unfortunates, New Orleans Jewish Orphans Home, 1855 to 1946, for LSU Press. Both books draw on Trestman's personal experiences. Orphaned at age 11, she grew up as a client of the Jewish Children's Regional Service, the agency that formerly ran the orphanage in which Margolin was raised. Spending time together while Trespin attended Goucher College and GW Law School and started her legal career, Margolin inspired her future biographer. A former special assistant to Maryland's attorney general, where she worked for more than 30 years, Trespin enforced consumer and public health laws, twice earning exceptional service awards. For her writing, she has received the Supreme Court Historical Society's Hughes Gossett Award, and funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Hadassah Brandeis Institute, and American Jewish Archives. Our moderator, Susan Jacobowitz, is one of the co-conveners conveners of our Scholars Working Group on Jewish Orphans. She is a professor of English at Queensborough Community College, part of the City University of New York. Research areas include second-generation experience, graphic depictions of war, and the conflicts and challenges of post-war Jewish identity. Her scholarship has been published in academic journals and edited collections, and in 2019, she received a fellowship from the Mellon Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies to complete a manuscript about her father and her own second generation identity entitled Far From Childhood, a Holocaust Memoir, which we discussed at a center program last month. Before we start, I have two technical notes. First, you're welcome to submit questions for the Q&A portion of our program using the Q&A function visible on the bottom of your screen. You can type your questions throughout the program. Note that the chat function has been disabled. Second, the program is being recorded and will be available on the center's website and YouTube channel soon. We will email you the link to the recording as soon as it's available. And now I turn this over to Susan. Thank you so much, Julie. I wanna welcome everyone who's joining us today. I know that my, my colleague, who also was facilitating this scholars working group at the Center for Jewish History, Amy Traver, would join me in thanking the Center for all of their support. It's been a really wonderful experience. And we want to thank all of our participants. The event on, on May 25th will feature scholarship from four of our participants. And uh, Marlene Trussman was also one of our participants. So we're going to get to hear about her book today. And um, we're so delighted to have Bernice Lerner and the two programs together, our focus was to look at the experience of the Jewish orphan. And I think these two texts in particular will give us some really interesting insights. We're going to start with Marlene's book. It's um, chronologically um, the earlier period that we'll be looking at. As, um, as the presentations are going on, each author will speak for about 20 minutes. You can be putting questions into the Q&A. So when we're able to open it up for questions, we'll have your questions there and we'll, we'll forward the questions to our speakers. So without any further ado, let me invite Marlene to begin her presentation and then we'll hear from Bernice. Thanks, Susan. And let me just get my screen shared here. 
Well, thanks again to the Center for Jewish History and the Scholars Working Group, which has been a wonderful experience. As you heard, I'm a lawyer by training and my three decade career, but I changed drastic course when I discovered two stories that needed telling, both about Jewish orphans. I'll talk first about Bessie Margolin, the subject of my first book, Fair Labor Lawyer, and how she led me to write my second forthcoming book, Most Fortunate Unfortunates, the history of New Orleans Jewish Orphans Home. Before there was the notorious RBG, may she rest in peace, there was the audacious Bessie Margolin, and she grew up in New Orleans Jewish Orphanage, where she learned powerful lessons in social justice that shaped her into one of America's most influential attorneys. Bessie Margolin made her mark on the biggest issues of her day, she defended the constitutionality of FDR's New Deal. She drafted rules for the Nazi war crimes trials in Nuremberg. And for more than three decades, she championed the Fair Labor Standards Act, which ultimately included the Equal Pay Act, which led her to become a founding member of NOW, the National Organization for Women. She began her career in 1930 when only 2% of America's lawyers were women and went on to argue 24 times at the Supreme Court, all to protect America's workers. After she retired in 1972, however, Margolin seemed to fade from the public record. It's not hard to understand why she deserved to be rescued from obscurity, but I'll start by explaining how I came to the task. In the fall of 1974, I was a freshman at Goucher College in Baltimore, far from my home in New Orleans. My guidance counselor at the Isidore Newman School had written Margolin, a distinguished Newman alumna from the class of 1925, the letter of introduction shown here. Through college, law school, and into my own legal career, I got to know Bessie Margolin. She was the first female lawyer I ever met, and we had been wards of the same Jewish Children's Welfare Agency, which educated both of us at the Newman School a half century apart. Orphaned at age 11, as you heard, my care was entrusted to the Jewish Children's Regional Service, which oversaw my foster care. Only 20 years earlier, the same agency ran the orphanage in which I surely would have been placed, just like Bessie Margolin, had it not closed. After Bessie died in 1996, I realized no one had ever written her life story, and I became her reluctant biographer. While researching her childhood, I found another story that needed telling, the home's history, and I seemed to be uniquely qualified to tell it. Because every child's experience in the home was unique, there are no representative children. But Bessie Margolin's story serves to highlight many aspects of the home's rich and colorful history within the context of New Orleans Jewish community. Bessie was born in 1909 in Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York, the first American born child of Russian Jewish immigrants. To escape New York's tough and crowded conditions, Bessie's family made its way to Memphis, where Bessie's mother died leaving Bessie's father alone to care for his three young children. The local B'nai B'rith petitioned the Jewish Orphans Home in New Orleans to accept the children as so-called half orphans. Since 1875, in exchange for a portion of its members' dues, B'nai B'rith had a right to admit eligible children into the home from the seven and one-half Mid-South states in the region of District 7. So in 1913, the orphanage admitted Bessie at age four and her siblings. Proclaimed a magnificent monument to Hebrew benevolence, the home, as it was known, sat prominently on St. Charles Avenue near the stately mansions of New Orleans most prosperous citizens. It was both a stunning contrast to the humble origins of its young residents and an inspiring symbol of what each of them could and many of them did achieve. In the home, Bessie grew up with more than 150 other orphans and half orphans from the Deep South. Its trustees were not content to provide them with mere subsistence. Instead, Bessie was groomed as an all-American girl who shed honor on the local Jewish community and reflected the values and culture of her prosperous benefactors. 
Throughout the home's history, the children were reared in Reform Judaism. During Bessie's time in particular, Superintendent Leon Vollmer, an ordained rabbi from West Virginia, led Shabbat and high holiday services in the home's synagogue, oversaw Hebrew lessons, Sunday school, confirmation, and he organized their observances for Passover and Sukkot, to which the community was invited. At the same time, the home was an important venue for spiritual leaders and other influential orators who promoted social justice by preaching reforms in public health, housing, and labor to address root causes of poverty and dependency. In addition to her religious education, the home provided Bessie a robust secular education at the Isidore Newman Manual Training School where the cutting edge curriculum emphasized manual skills in home economics and woodworking, as well as rigorous academics. The home built this unique school in 1903 to educate its wards first, but also admitted New Orleans children of all religions, albeit then only white children, whose parents paid tuition. The home's board was determined to give its children a superior education side by side with other children from the community. In doing so, the home's creation of Newman School remains unique. It may be the only such relationship in the country between a religious institution and a private co-ed secular school. Newman quickly became what it still remains today, one of the South's finest college prep schools. Bessie graduated from Newman in 1925 as a 16 year old leader who was comfortable in a co ed setting, competing, succeeding, and winning respect. She won a coveted scholarship to Newcomb College, Tulane's coordinate college for women, where she ranked among the top 10 in her class. But the audacious Bessie decided to attend Tulane Law School, to, to attend law school, something no other girl from the home had ever done. In June 1930, at age 21, Bessie graduated second in her Tulane Law School class and was an editor of the Law Review. With glowing recommendations from Tulane, Bessie got a job at Yale Law School as a research assistant and within a year became the first woman awarded Yale's Sterling Fellowship for Graduate Studies. With her Yale doctorate, Bessie moved to Washington. She got a job at the Tennessee Valley Authority which Congress had just created to supply electricity to the Valley's most impoverished residents. There, as a key member of TVA's brilliant legal team and its only woman, she materially shaped the briefs for two landmark Supreme Court cases that upheld TVA's power program, which was a cornerstone of FDR's New Deal. In March 1939, Bessie joined the Labor Department where another New Deal program awaited enforcement. The Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 prohibited child labor and guaranteed minimum wages and overtime. Bessie was there as every aspect of the new law was tested and she was heralded back in New Orleans as the local orphan girl who made good. Lest you think that Bessie was all work and no play, think again. Her penchant for passion sparked federal investigations that, due to time constraints, you'll have to read about in my book. But the drama of Bessie's personal life never impeded her work, which earned her the prestigious assignment of representing the Labor Department at the Supreme Court. In March 1945, when little Ruthie Bader was only 12, Margolin argued her first case at the Supreme Court making her only the 25th woman ever to do so. The end of World War II created a new and exciting legal pursuit. In May 1946, Bessie traveled to Nuremberg to organize the American military tribunals. For her six month tour of duty, the Army's commanding officer acknowledged Bessie's primary role in drafting the rules for the war crimes trials of nearly 200 Nazis including the judges, the doctors, and the industrialists. In late 1946, Bessie returned to the Labor Department where she oversaw all litigation and appeals. By the time she retired in 1972, in addition to arguing 24 Fair Labor Standards Act cases at the Supreme Court, 
She also oversaw the filing of 300 equal pay lawsuits in 40 states, earning her the title of the nation's number one fighter for equal pay for women. At Bessie's gala retirement dinner in 1972, Chief Justice Earl Warren lauded Margolin as a great public servant who helped millions of American workers by putting what he called the flesh and sinews on the bare bones of the Fair Labor Standards Act, without which he said the law would have been wholly inadequate. He also praised Margolin for proving equality for women in a man's world of law. So this brings me to my current book in progress. Bessie Margolin's remarkable life and career, and indeed her audacity, were made possible by her childhood in the home. It was there she experienced social justice firsthand and enjoyed the extraordinary educational opportunities that equipped her to compete and succeed. Even without a woman lawyer as a role model, Bessie learned to carry herself with the same grace, dignity, and purpose as the grand dames of New Orleans Jewish community who volunteered their time to mentor her and other home children. My fascination with Bessie's time in the home and the impact it had on her life led me to write the rich and colorful history of the home. The home was born from the fatal aftermath of New Orleans yellow fever epidemics of 1853 and 1854, the worst the nation has ever seen. Although there were already at least nine non-Jewish orphanages in New Orleans, including the nation's oldest orphanage founded by Ursuline nuns in 1726, the home's founders wanted to raise Jewish children within their faith. For about a decade, the local Hebrew benevolent societies had supported needy Jews, but the home's founders wanted a permanent solution to address the ongoing needs of Jewish widows and orphans. They're, they were building the first Jewish orphanage in the country. It opened just six months after Philadelphia's Jewish orphanage, but that opened in rented quarters. And it was the first American asylum to house both Jewish orphans and widows. By 1900, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, 20 Jewish orphanages had opened across the country, later more than doubling. Until 1930, the home remained the only Jewish orphanage throughout the seven Mid-South states in B'nai B'rith's Region 7. The home's founders represented New Orleans' most prosperous Jews of the time, but as a group, they were certainly not as prosperous as they were going to become over the next few decades. Gathering the money to build the orphanage was not easy, but Jews in New Orleans were driven as much by the biblical mandate to care for widows and or orphans, repeated no fewer than 36 times in the Torah, as by the desire to avoid anti-Semitism by caring for their own. Moreover, New Orleans' Jewish population, albeit the largest in the South, was not so large that it could allow factions to undermine the project, as was the case in New York City, where bitter feuding between Orthodox Sephardic Jews and Reformed German Jews delayed the opening of New York's Hebrew Orphan Asylum from 1822 until 1860. Over the home's 90 years as an orphanage, in two different buildings and under three different names, by my count, a total of 1,623 children and 24 widows lived in the home. Although the earliest admissions largely resulted from yellow fever, the first structure housed as many as 140 children at any one time who lost one or both parents from myriad other maladies as well, including and misfortunes and, and dysfunctions. In its later years, the home officially expanded its mission to encompass any Jewish children whose parents were incapable of caring for them, even if both alive. The maximum occupancy of the home on St. Charles Avenue, shown on the right, was approximately 180 children, which occurred only briefly in the early 20th century. Dwarfed by Cleveland's Jewish Orphanage and New York's Hebrew Orphan Asylum, which reached peak occupancies of 600 and nearly 1,800 respectively, 
the home was closest in size to Philadelphia's and Atlanta's Jewish orphanages. So who were the children who lived in the home? Where did they come from? Those 1,623 children were admitted from at least nine states, encompassing no fewer than 128 communities. No fewer than 209 of the home's children were foreign born, mostly arriving in the first few decades. They were largely born in Eastern Europe, although at least 5% were natives of the Caribbean and the West Indies. The nativity of the home's children reflects the extensive geographic mobility of Southern Jews who sought to make their way in America. The Goldsticker family, for example, in the upper portion of the slide, as you can see, traveled from France to Brooklyn and on to Monroe, Louisiana, before the children were admitted to the home in 1875. The home as an institution also enabled siblings, even in large family groups, to remain together. The home's average age is at, at admission, age at admission was seven, while most children fell between the ages of three and 12, which by 1900 was generally the cutoff, the maximum age for admission. But even then, the board, a lay group, made occasional exceptions to keep siblings together. And the home appears to have been unique among its peer institutions for admitting infants and small children. Their average length of stay was seven years, with one in five children living in the home for 10 to 15 years. In general, the board discharged children when they were deemed self-sufficient or as in 70% of the cases, could be returned to a parent or relative. Although the home's board exerted great control, the superintendents they hired shaped the children's daily lives. It was under Superintendent Michelle Hyman from 1886 to 1909, for example, that the home's kindergarten, one of the earliest in the region, became a training ground for the city's kindergarten teachers. The divided and concentric circles on the floor were painted in bright primary colors, then a novel device to encourage physical movement. Although superintendent for only two years, from 1909 to 1911, Chester Jacob Teller transformed the home for the next two decades by introducing a form of self-government he named the Golden City in which the children elected big brothers and big sisters, who not only headed small family groups, but also set the rules and determined rewards and penalties. Teller had brought the idea with him from his prior position at New York's Hebrew Shelter and Guardian Society, which in turn had adopted the model from New York's Freeville Junior Republic. Superintendent Leon Vollmer sought to enhance the home's family nature by cutting the long dining room tables in half to create smaller groupings. But his most beloved innovation starting in 1918 was sending the children for weeks at a time to the Federation summer camp in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. By 1926, faced with mounting opposition to institutional care, many orphanages, Jewish and non-Jewish, were closing or transforming. But the home responded to the, to the trend by becoming more home-like. Superintendent Ed Lashman, previously at Cleveland's Jewish Orphanage, began dismantling all insular institutional activities. He shut down the home synagogue and sent the children to the three nearby reform congregations and disbanded the Golden City's clubs and organizations, instead enrolling the children in neighborhood groups like their peers. Successor Uncle Harry Ginsburg zealously continued the process, converting the long barren dormitories into small cozy bedrooms and scaled back the home's elaborate anniversary celebrations to make them more kid friendly. As dwindling enrollment, resulting from decreasing parent mortality and the advent of social security, coupled with high fixed costs, made the home's continued existence financially unfeasible. It was Ginsburg's sudden death in June 1946 that hastened the home's inevitable closure later that year. The board transformed the organization into a non-residential agency that today 
may be the nation's oldest continuously operating Jewish children's welfare agency. Time constrains me from addressing other noteworthy topics, such as the stories of the home alumni that I've captured through more than 100 interviews, or how to judge the children's experiences within evolving contexts of childhood, and, and not simply by our standards today, or the crucial role played by women in the home, or the unique context created by simply being in New Orleans, not the least of which were celebrating the home's anniversary on January 8th in honor of the Battle of New Orleans, and the exile of several key board members who refused to pledge allegiance to the Union during the Civil War, or the extent to which the home served to elevate and unify the Jewish community throughout the Mid-South. I'll address those topics in the book, if not in our Q&A. Thank you for honoring me with your attention. Marlene, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. I know there will be some questions that if people want to start putting them into the Q&A, then we can, you know, we'll be ready for our Q&A period. Bernice, let me turn it over to you. Okay, so um, Marlene, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. And as I'm listening, of course, I'm, I'm thinking about some common elements, which I mean, the biggest one is namely that what I'm going to talk about is just the difference caring, thoughtful adults can make in a child's life. So I'm going to share my screen now and talk about a very different story, actually. So I'm going to talk about the Jewish orphan experience post-World War II of Holocaust survivors of children. And I should just say that there were so, who were, very few children comparatively survived the Holocaust, right? They were the one, you know, they were targeted immediately for death if they maybe were in hiding or very few, but some squeaked by in one way or another. And there were even some in Bergen-Belsen, which was the largest depository of the war worn at the end of the war. So, I'm going to talk about what happens with these with these children and everyone's experience was different, but I'm going to hone in on my mom's experience. My mom was a very young survivor and she was 15 at the end of the war and she wound up in Sweden. The Swedish government took in people. But as I was really going deep into her story, I realized that she was a subject of a great experiment in educating refugee children. So I wrote a dual biography of my mom, who's up here, and a brigadier, Glenn Hughes, who was the liberator of Bergen-Belsen. And here my aunt mom is in a tuberculosis sanatorium in snowy Northwest Sweden called Arvika. And I'm including the British edition so you can see her in full form here. Um, you could see she's well nourished here, but you could see there's a very sad and serious look in her eye. And uh, that would probably, that's to be expected. She was deathly ill of tuberculosis and she was orphaned. She had lost her parents in the war and four younger siblings. Only she and her older sister survived. So the structure of my book, which I'm, I'm not going to talk about the contents very much, is just I, I have a prologue and an epilogue, which tells really important aspects of the story. I also um, sandwich the story in between the bells and trial because there's some really important information to set the scene. And here's an image of it from an Army Talks magazine. And Brigadier Glenn Hughes, one of my protagonists, the other protagonist was the um, first witness at this war crimes trial, which immediately preceded the Nuremberg trials and was the first trial to apply international law to the Nazi crimes. And as first, first witness, he set the tone of the case. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I'll just tell you that the way I constructed these two disparate lives, this British army officer and my mom, who's this young teenager, is by telling the story as a race against time rescue story over the last year of the war. So I discuss where each of them are during the four seasons from the spring of 1944 to the winter of 1945, and then the fifth season, the point at their convergence in this hell, which was Bergen-Belsen, where my mom is laying, dying, really at death's door, and the British army arrives in the nick of time. 
What I'm going to talk about in this talk is something that happens in the epilogue. So just to give you an idea of the journey, uh, here's my mom, she's from Siget, Transylvania, was taken to Auschwitz and then to a labor camp, then on a death march and then wound up in Bergen-Belsen as the Germans were force, force marching the remaining inmates, those who had already survived so much away from the liberating forces from the Red Army. So um, I just did this little statistical study of um, the birth year of Belsen survivors from Siget who arrived in Sweden. The Swedish government took in about 7,000 of the very sick survivors from Bergen-Belsen. There was, just so, you, just so you have an idea of context, the British army found 60,000 still alive inmates in Bergen-Belsen at the time of the liberation. 25,000 were in need of immediate medical attention. 500 were dying each day after the war for at least a month. It was, uh, 17,000 people died in the month of March when my mom arrived at the camp. It was a scene of that was just indescribable horror. I can't imagine it. And I've been studying this a lot of my life and um, no one who was there can really tell what it was like. My mom herself had barely any strength in her at the end of the war and was forced to drag people, mostly people who had died, occasionally someone who was still breathing, who was 90% dead to mass graves in Bergen-Belsen. So uh, this is just a little calculation of uh, out of the 12 to 13,000 people who were, in, who were deported from Siget to Auschwitz, um, most 80 to 90% were gassed upon arrival. And then toward the end of the war, they could have wound up in different places. They could have been liberated in different places if they survived. More died along the way. Um, those who were in, from in Bergen-Belsen, there are some maybe survivors from Siget who did not go to Sweden, but uh, there were 174 who did from my mom's hometown. And you could see that it was, this roughly shows you who survived the war, who had a chance of surviving. So if they were in their 50s, they had very little chance. And even in their 40s, people in their 30s sometimes survived and mostly in their 20s. And here's my mom born in 1929. She was 15 years old and she survived with her sister who was born in 1928. So after being quarantined in Sweden, my mom was taken to a makeshift hospital in Katrina home. Uh, the Swedish government uh, put people in different places. And here's my mom, I blew up this picture. It's very precious to me because it's the first and picture we have of her. We don't have any picture of her childhood and uh, from her childhood. And you can see she had been badly beaten up at the end of the war and she still has bruises under her eyes. And she was very sick in this place. And this doctor, Dr. Leffler nursed her. It was the first time she had personalized medical attention and, and um, was helped and then was taken to RVK. So, um, the work of the Swedish Red Cross in bringing the um, war refugees to Sweden was monumental. Um, it was a humanitarian gesture, it may have been for other reasons, um, but I will leave that for other people's conjecture. Um, they took in 7,006 survivors from Sweden and thousands of others from, uh, from Bergen-Belsen and thousands of others from other places under some kind of negotiation between Heinrich Himmler and Count Folk Bernadotte at the end of the war. The work of the state's foreign commission and Royal Civil Civilian Guard was huge. They had to place all these people. They, if they were sick, they went to hospitals, sanatoriums, rest homes, there were schools, there were refugee camps. There was a governmental order in September, 1945. The young among the homeless should have some schooling because you did have some young teenagers who survived who came. So 10 internat schools, international schools, international because these were survivors from everywhere, right? All over Europe were set up in various locations and student recruitment began. So the, um, um, one of the men who ran the, um, who ran uh, like displaced persons homes for women, he, he applied to be in charge of one of the 10 internat schools and 
His name was Ellie Gatroy. And a lot of the information I have is from him and from his PhD thesis. And he set up this school, one of the 10 schools in a place called Beach Beachuby. My mom pronounced it. It was in, or it, it was at Smedsbo, very remote town. It took a, at least a 30 minute ride from the nearest train station to get to this place. It was a former internment camp. And here's the main building, which housed the really the sickest who couldn't go out so much in the cold. And here were cottages surrounding the, the building or nearby. And they had like four to five girls living in a cottage. Um, my mom was placed in the main building. Um, I should just, yeah, I should just say that um, it was, Oh, there, it took a while to recruit students for this. Ellie Gatroy had to really have long conversations and convince young people to sign up for these schools. They were very leery of making any changes. They were very suspicious of everything. At first he got 35 students and then another 20 students. So there was about 55 students here. The number was a little bit fluid because Sometimes the girls got sick, many of them had TB. They came to Sweden, maybe weighing 70 pounds, 80 pounds. They were emaciated, they were so sick. So the healthier ones began the school at early on, maybe by October, 1945. My mom didn't come until the following summer of 1946, right? She had been in the hospital and then in Arvika where the cover of the book shows her and the TB sanatorium. It took her a while to even get well enough to come. Some girls came and then they had to leave sometimes for medical treatment. But so you have this, this place where you have these war orphans ages from 15 was the youngest, 18 they had to go out and make their way in the world. And, and this, is, this is the story of how are you going to educate them? So. Ali Gatroy um, went about getting staff, a cook, and he hired these teachers. And three of these people were really instrumental in my mom's life, I would say. They were sort of life-changing. Um, here's Ellie Gatroy in the middle here. I don't know if the other people around here are staff, but here is this teacher called Vali, who was from Munkach, and she she was in her 30s. They were the teachers were in their 30s. She and this woman, Alika had survived the war. They were survivors too. So they were in their thirties. They had been teachers before the war. They understood the girls and where they had been and what they had seen and what they had come from. And here again, this is Vali and Alika. And uh, Vali was mostly teaching Hebrew and Zionism and Jewish subjects. And Alika was teaching literature and the classics and making stories come alive for the girls. But this wasn't all they were about and teaching. And I'm just going to, this is a group picture of, of um, Smedsbo, um, B2B. And here's my mom in this picture. And I blew it up so you could see her a little closer. But you could see this is, this is already at a time when a community has formed in this place. <sighs> but what were the challenges? How do you go from a concentration camp to a classroom? How do you go from seeing your brother beaten to death or, or sorting the clothes of your friends after they've been taken to the gas chamber ha, or, or having to, to drag corpses or having, to, having been so abused. How do you take these kids almost in the immediate aftermath and put them in school? Like how, how does that work? How could environmentally damaged teenagers concentrate on learning? Why should they trust authority? how to fortify them for their uncharted future. You only have them from, they stayed maybe from nine months to two years tops. Like, what are you gonna teach them? How are you gonna tell them that the world is not like the concentration camp? And this is a quote from one of the Snedsboites. Every one of the students was a riddle in their own way. Everyone, but initially many of the students were disillusioned, resigned, sad, withdrawn. Fragile, sensitive, wary, bitter, needy, ungrateful, pessimistic, and perplexed. This was a tough, tough population of young women to educate. They were uncertain. Did any of their loved ones survive? Mail time was the biggest and most fraught event of the day because there were international Red Cross lists with names of survivors. 
Did anyone survive? Did a parent survive? Did an uncle survive? This, I have to tell you, was also the time of the day of the greatest disappointment. And because in only in very few cases did someone come looking for one of these girls. And then where could they make their future lives? I don't know where I'm gonna live. I, I, most of them didn't feel like they could go back to their homes. There was nothing left there. Where could they go? Palestine was a, a big, there was a big push for them to go there to make their future lives there. Maybe America, Chile, Argentina, where were they gonna go? Would they stay in Sweden? And they were consumed with worry. How would they take care of themselves? There was no parent to guide them. There was no, the, the only older people who could guide them were this Alika and Vali and Eligatroy. They were the adults. They looked to them as their guides, their parents. And then would they ever get well? So the goals of these teachers were to help students find meaning in existence to awaken their zest for life. These are tall order goals to broaden their intellectual horizons and inspire them to take responsibility for their own learning. As my mom would always say, Alika, she had the words in her mind from Alika, I can only give you a taste. You're going to have to go out there, live near a big city, take advantage of culture, go to the theater, go to opera. They had to provide a new positive experience for the students. So they learned that there's, they don't have to just follow orders and demands and their life isn't threatened. And they wanted to create a collective, a large supportive family. They wanted to encourage adaptability. Students would have to adjust to other places, to normal communities. It's not normal in normal life to always take bread and from a meal and put it under your pillow at night. Remember, these girls had been starved. How were they going to conduct themselves in normal life? And they had to educate for tolerance, tolerance, caring about other people, doing good in the world. They had to relieve the students of their hatefulness of Germans and all Germans and inspire them to find goodness and beauty in the world. And they wanted to foster self-respect and trust and the ability to think for themselves. So a very, the, these teachers just like were very intuitive and figuring it out as they went. But if a student would come to them for advice, they wanted their suggestions. Very often the question was turned back to them. Well, what do you think? What would you do? Because these teachers knew that at age 18, these kids were out of here and they would be on their own in the world. So this is a quote from a former student. They enabled us to differentiate the essential from the non-essential to actively and independently problem solve. Now there was a lot of resistance at first, but there were certain opportunities here because even though these girls came from very different backgrounds, some of their parents were well off, some had maids, um, some, some parents were laborers, some were from the countryside. They were from all different places before the war, all different backgrounds. What the background that mattered the most was Auschwitz and the labor camp and Bergen-Belsen. Everybody was on an equal plane in those places and they had all witnessed the same horrors that no one else could understand. Their loneliness gave way to very intense friendships the fact that the school was isolated was a problem for some because the girls wanted more like the excitement of a city or a town, but it also could create a feeling of home. And they were motivated. In the end, a lot of them wanted to learn. They figured this was our last chance. We could go out in the world and how long it will it be before we are able to sit in the classroom again and get an education? And also, what if we do go to Palestine? Like, how are we going to know Hebrew? What if we go to America? How are we going to learn English? And all those languages were taught. So um, this is my Aunt Elizabeth at the school here and here in a sweater my mom made for her. My mom made the same twin sweater for herself. Here's my mom with one of her, her best friends is Miriam. And these friendships lasted their entire lives. I, Growing up, I always thought of the friends my mom made in this school as her closest friends, even though she lived in the United States and they lived in Israel. So the methods, how, were, how did the teachers go about it? First of all, strange, like really strange experiment. The classes were optional. The students decided what they wanted to learn. 
some of them really freaked out about this in the beginning. This is not the kind of schooling some of them had previously. And here the, everyone was called by their first name. How were they gonna respect teachers if they called, didn't call them Miss or Mrs. or Mr.? And, but the teachers strove to be very tender, understanding, friendly, and to gain intimate knowledge of each student and to have democratic practices. Like Marlene spoke about self-governance, self everything, you know, they, they brought the girls together and they had meetings and they judged things and deciding where, how to rotate a radio among the different cottages or how to take the nice rug. There's only one nice rug. How do you rotate it among the different girls' rooms was a like worthy of a UN sessions. They, they just discussed everything and they had a lot of extracurricular activities. So very quickly, um, here are some of the courses the girls loved, they lo um, that they needed. They talked about religion and they talked about Judaism in the context of other religions. They talked about Confucius and Lao Tzu and why the Jews are hated. And they talked about so many things. Child development was sort of a way to couch sex education. Uh, talking because the girls, a lot of girls didn't ha didn't know very much. So they, they taught them everything from the embryo to marriage and relationships. And so these were some of the, lots of current events were discussed. Anything that came up became like an opportunity for learning. And this girl on the upper left was um, someone my mom came with from Arvika, from the TB sanatorium to the school in Smedsbo or Bichubi. And her name was Shari. And they did not participate in a lot of things because they were really hell bent on catching up with the months of learning that they missed. And on my mom's album, all of the pictures in the back have these beautiful, beautiful um, sayings, just very loving uh, messages from whoever the girl was a picture of. She has more pictures, definitely more pictures than I have of my young adult years. And here is a classroom, and this is Ellie Gatroy teaching a lesson. And this is my mom. And I love this picture because she's so happy here. And you could see the difference from Arvika to here, learning. And here they had little things to really uh, get the girls excited about something. And even in this case, to make your room more of a home, they had like a decorating contest. And it was judged by a girl from each home and a teacher, but all the girls tried to make their living quarters nice. And they had here the, they had a lot of extracurricular activities here. A group of girls is performing in Stockholm for the Jewish organization, the Mosaiska Forsanlingen. Maybe it was a fundraising thing. They're performing in Hebrew as Chalutzim. They were dancing. There were a lot of dancing. The one, woman on the left is my, is my aunt. And finally, they were mostly girls, but finally in July of 1947, Ellie Gatroy went to one of the schools that had dissolved, one of the other internet schools and brought nine boys. And my mom was like in heaven when this very handsome young man asked her to dance at a dance. So you could just see some of the fun they were having celebrating Tu Bishvat. This picture on the right is I was always captivated by it. I could not figure out why is a group of girls dancing around a car? Well, it was so logical to my mother as she explained it. Oh, they brought from film reels. It was so exciting that they brought in film reels to show a movie in the place. The girls were so excited. So unjaded and appreciative, not like today where you can see anything you want on Netflix. But here they are just dancing around the car, so excited, no matter the quality of the film was poor. And they had a lot of spontaneous dress up, some for Purim, where well, here's Ellie Gatroy, here's my mom's friend, Lily. And, you know, but some were just spontaneous. And, um, and Ellie Gatroy and his thesis thought of these dress ups as an unconscious flight to a problem free world. They love dressing up in wedding scenes with a bride and a groom. And here's my aunt and my aunt and my mom love to dress up as men, always dressing up as men. And this is, I'll end with, this is a sad, sad picture. Here was my mom's roommate. This was a girl, Risey, whom she went to school with in Siget. And you can imagine the excitement of finding someone from your hometown after all you've endured in the war. And this girl, Risey, here she is, 
Risey was loved to entertain all the other women. She was just, was very lively and fun. And they called her the Mosaiska, named after the Jewish organization that organized everything in Stockholm, the Mosaiska for Sunling. And, and here, here she is. And she died one year after this picture was taken in Stockholm of tuberculosis. And that was a pretty common occurrence. One girl died in, in, um, in the school in Smedsbo of tuberculosis, another died of a brain inflammation related to being sick. So fast forward six years, um, my mom had a lot of adventures and experiences in Sweden after she was let go, but here she is in a business school, one of three girls in the class. And the greatest excitement of being in the business school was that she got a free pass to go to the Opera House in Stockholm, and the I mean the Royal Theater, and um, and this is how much how her life was turned, how her soul was turned in this place. Even though she wasn't there for a very long period, under a year, these teachers brought uh, brought something into her life that I did not, I have not seen this kind of love of culture, of story, of literature in other of the Holocaust survivors I know who are older and didn't have this kind of opportunity, this experimental education. So the source of, of, of the material for this, um, there's some other stories in, in my book about this, but is Ellie Gatroy wound up writing his doctoral thesis on his experience of educating these girls. And it was in Swedish, but my mom, thank God, she's my research assistant and the protagonist in my book. And she translated it from the Swedish into the English when she was 80 years old. And you can just imagine her getting this document um, showing how deliberate and thoughtful this experimental education she underwent was. And here, if you have questions later, here is my email address. And that's my presentation. That was so- oh, That wonderful. wasn't my email, that was my website. <laughs> that was <so laughs> wonderful, Bernice, thank you so much. We are going to have some time for questions and both these presentations were really just amazing. So dynamic. So thank you to both of you for all of your work and for the images, which I think are just so striking. I know we have some questions about orphanages in New York and the orphan experience in New York. And this is not really the focus you know, of, of the talk today, but there is certainly a lot of information about the orphan experience in New York. So I think that would be possible through the center for people to, um, to try to explore some of that. Marlene, we had a question for you about the about what your own experiences in foster care were and how the home's legacy influenced this, if at all. And then the segregation, if you wanted to say a little bit about, about race, which I know in learning about some of the or orphan institutions during the course of the group, we've been, we've been learning about how people sort of had their own orphanages to take care of their own children in their own communities. Right. Um, and thank and Bernice, that was just wonderful. Thank thank you for for doing that. And I love the way the experiences chronologically dovetail um, and and overlap a little bit in terms of the attempts to make things more homey for the for the residents. Um, in terms of my own experience, I'll I'll answer it. I I think the question was really getting at how did uh, coming from the history of being an orphanage affect the way the institution handled foster care. And what's so interesting is I alluded only briefly, and I'm only gonna talk briefly as well, given the amount of time, that the home in New Orleans really resisted, resisted the, the more current trends of professionalized social work and the placement of children in foster care. And it wasn't that the home as an institution was alone in this, you have to consider it within the context of New Orleans and Louisiana. Um, and in general, foster care, you know, into the probably 1930s was not really well supported and fleshed out in New Orleans. Um, and the home did not change its constitution to really mandate or authorize overseeing foster care until almost, I recall, into the late 30s. So um, it was something that sort of came long and hard. But once the decision was made, once the large structure on St. Charles Avenue um, could no longer be kept and the home transformed, it did so with real gusto. Um, and so foster care, of course, became the way that um, this agency handled things uh, as, as others around the country. And I just want to note that there was really wonderful 
overlap and sharing of ideas. They often resisted each other as much as they influenced each other within the Jewish orphan world of superintendents and board presidents to the National Conference of Jewish Social Work. And they would meet annually and have other organizations, uh, other meetings. Um, so there was lots. And I, I alluded to that in my talk about how, you know, the superintendents had come from one place and brought ideas with them. In, in my case, um, it, I was very fortunate. My mother, when she died, my father predeceased her, had really close friends from our synagogue. And it was friends that my brother and I were each separately placed with very dear friends, people we knew, but legally we were wards of the state and our custody was supervised by, by the institution. And, you know, I feel so blessed until her death. My foster mother is the only maternal grandmother my children know and, and feel that way about her. So it's an exceptional circumstance, I too am the most fortunate, unfortunate in, in that regard, um, and in my education, all the opportunities. R race is a complex subject with Jews generally, perhaps with Jews in New Orleans even more so, because New Orleans is such a complicated place. Um, my book starts by really peeling the onion skin back on the romance of the founders, you know, many of them enslaved people at the very same time that um, the founders were getting together to build this home. You know, I mentioned the biblical mandate to care for widows and orphans. Abraham Haber and his wife, who was the first directress of the matrons, who were the volunteer women who helped oversee the children, Abraham Haber was posting a notice for a reward for a runaway slave, today an enslaved person. Um, so it's complicated. People are complicated. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Along the way, some of the alumni that I had the privilege of speaking with recalled some of their dearest memories and most um, personal attention from the people who cared for the infants and who provided the food and who were at the summer camp and they were African-American. And it, yes, it is complicated in that sense of they were in subservient positions. I'm not trying to say that there was any sort of, uh, um, you know, they were certainly not moving the barriers on race relations, but for these children, these African-Americans were instrumental. I'll give you one example. Joe Bahari, who went on to become inducted in the Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame, attributes his love of rhythm and blues to spending hours with Willie Parker, the um, African-American carpenter of, and jack of all trades who was in the home, who would play Mississippi music for Joe, in addition to Joe's music lessons at the Isidore Newman School two blocks away. And others, when they returned from the war, um, after World War, well, those who were coming back early talked about coming back and seeing Lottie, the cook, who they dearly loved, and she greeted them like her own children. And again, I am not minimizing the absolute racism that existed in New Orleans, um, but it's a complicated thing. There were alums who also went on to break racial barriers. Benny Shanker went on and oversaw one of the Navy's first experiments. I think it was the first, and it was a successful experiment to integrate the Navy. There were stories about uh, young men who grew up to be doctors, who against all tradition and barriers in small towns in Texas and Alabama, saw black and white patients. So those are just anecdotal. I can't possibly cover it, but um, it's, a, it's a sticky and really fascinating question, not to mention the whole Civil War experience and reconstruction. So um, it's, it's a big subject. Yeah, I'm subject. glad we will kind of touch upon it. I think there are some doctoral dissertations that we're going to see at some point. The, focus on it. the book's going to be cracking at it. So. Yeah, right. Bernice, there was a question about Ellie Gatroy. Am I saying his name correctly? That's so interesting to learn more about him, but whether or not he might have been influenced by some of the ideas of Janusz Korczak, who was so you know, prominent in the field of orphan 
environment and education. Do you know if there was any awareness um, on his part of Korczak? I don't. I mean, Korczak was so inspirational for so many people. And he, I don't know what Ellie Gatroy's sources of inspiration were. It was maybe, um, maybe a little bit different because they were a little bit shooting in the dark and um, this place that Ellie Gatroy set up because they, it was unlike anything. It was unlike your typical, it wasn't, there, not that there's a typical orphan or early, you know, childhood experience and education. It was like Yanush Korjak in that Korjak's um, charges, when they, when they left, they were sort of, they were sort of annoyed with Korjak because you let us, you educated us in this bubble and everything was democratic and everything was decided on and we had a court and everything was, um, you know, everyone was so honest and we had, we, we were careful with each other and we learned all these values and character and morals and then we you turned us out into the real world. So in a way that wasn't the case because they were, they were working with these children who they were trying to prepare them for the real world, the real world, but they had to undo a lot of the, the students feelings about what the world was like because authority figures were, it was, they had been under such danger and such threat. So I don't know, Ellie Gatroy was experimenting. I mean, it was really an experimental thing. He did travel to other places. He traveled to England. He set up pen pals for the girls. He, he, but I don't know, I, he, he was definitely very psychologically minded. I don't know where he got his ideas. We're all on a first name basis, we're all friends. But some of the things were backfiring on him and he had to backtrack along the way. Like if you give too much freedom, like, you know, that's not good either. They, they, the girls have to learn that with freedom comes responsibility. So I think he was learning as he was going. He had got ideas from some places, but he, and Alika and Vali sat down twice a week and they discussed individual cases and they really tried, they tried, they were met in some cases with, with rage from some girls and they tried to always respond with empathy and understanding. And I think in my mom's case and my aunt's case, it was, they were very, very successful. And Bernice, what's the plan that, that, that the, people who were brought there would stay in Sweden, or you mentioned that you know some people were envisioning emigrating someplace else. Was there that option to become Swedish citizens and stay in Sweden? You know, I think my mom is on this call and she, she could better answer that. A lot of people stayed in Sweden. They were there, the Swedish government thought people would be rehabilitated and go back to their home countries. But um, three years after the school was dis dissolved, Ellie Wiesel, uh, Ellie, Ellie Gatroy sent out a survey to people, to um, students as many as he could track down. And um, like 19 of them were still in Sweden, but the others were dispersed all over the world. Many were also in, in Israel, but um, mom, <laughs> Ruth Mermelstein is my mom. Maybe she can unmute herself and just answer that question. Like, did you have the option of becoming a Swedish citizen? Mm -hmm. After seven years, you become automatically a Swedish citizen. But there were not too many opportunities to really to make a uh, to get get a good profession or get to make a good living there for most mm -hmm. of the Jewish people. Some of the girls intermarried to both Swedish Jewish guys and to also Christians, and they stayed they stayed there. Not too many, but quite a lot stayed behind. It's so interesting. And it's interesting to think of everyone being brought together. There was a question also about language. Maybe your mother wants to tell us about that. With everybody coming and speaking different languages, was what was the language of the school? The teacher spoke many lang different languages. They came from Czechoslovakia. Everybody spoke new German because being in Germany for about a year or longer, I, I don't remember if you could understand Hungarian, then they're going to ex explain to you in Yiddish or it was a wonderful place to be because it was called Internat School, International School, because students were from all over. And we did speak many different languages, but we got along some or another. We learned to speak Hebrew there and English. Those were mandatory languages, but we also had to learn Swedish. Yeah. And I don't know. <laughs> 
when you live in Europe, you have to learn many languages and could understand each other very easily. The main language instruction that I read was uh, German. That was the main language of instruction, but also many, many times they also taught in Hungarian, which the majority understood. They were from Czechoslovakia, Romania, Hungary, and that was, a lot of them were from the region that was Hungary before the war. So many of them understood that language, but there was a girl from Greece, there was a girl from Italy, so. Marlene, there was a question. This, this is just so fascinating. I, I'm so thrilled to learn more about that school. You know, Elie Wiesel described being in a, in a home in France that was kind of similar with the education and the young people who were sort of helping to rehabilitate them in, in a sense, you know, to get them ready to go into the world. But Marlene, let me ask you, there, was, there were a few questions about the, the, the you mentioned the reform school. So the, the reform synagogue. So who controlled the orphanages and who controlled the religious education? Did the, you know, the Orthodox have their own orphanages or was it something that came out of the reform world? But what dictated how you were raised, in which denomination you were raised as a Jew? Students, survivors, girls, not, boys. That's survivors. from Marlene, right? Oh, yeah, that was from Marlene, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Ruth, you can chime in afterwards. It's okay. <laughs> Now, the, the home in New Orleans was built and in its constitution didn't distinguish one from the other, but said that they would follow the, the uh, strict rules of uh, dietary observance or some, I don't have the precise word, but it didn't use the word kashrut, and that the children would attend services. And there were by that time um, a, several synagogues, but it was the, the the Sephardic Jews who had really assimilated and the uh, Reform Jews who were on the board and were the founders. Um, and as I indicated, there really wasn't a big enough population in New Orleans for factions to form. Later in the Holmes years, the rabbis of all the synagogues, including my Orthodox synagogue in New Orleans, were on the Holmes board. But the children were raised, especially after they sent them to the, the temples nearby, the closest ones nearby were all reform, um, that pretty much cemented it. But in other cities, if it, the list that I put up before, and anyone who's interested, there's a copy on my website, just marlenetrustman.com. You can see there's 47, 48, and some of them actually have Orthodox in the title. New York, um, in, in many cities, Chicago, there were both Reform and others were Orthodox. But in New Orleans, B'nai B'rith itself and the home, it was always a Reform institution. Early on, it was very pious Reform. You know, the kids were involved in uh, one of the industries they raised money was matzah making to sell to the to the shuls nearby in the synagogues. So it was it was always in the reform tradition, but um, there was not I could not find in any of the board meetings what I sort of hoped to at least see alluded to some you know issue over should they should there be bar mitzvah should there be this in fact the only thing was that B'nai B'rith was upset around the 1930s after the kids started in order to become more assimilated in their Jewish neighborhoods with the Jewish peers and not be institutionalized, stigmatized by institutions. B'nai B'rith was concerned that there wasn't enough Jewish education of any kind. And that actually was simply because the kids were getting the same level Jewish education, Sunday school, Hebrew school confirmation, as the reform kids in New Orleans. That was a big dispute, simply not enough of any kind of Jewish learning. B'nai B'rith was, was not insisting it be orthodox. That's so interesting. Ruth, before we run out of time, can I ask you one more question? Was it, was it disappointing to be in a location that was so isolated? You know, that love of culture and entertainment and the things that people were really missing, that would be very hard being in such a... Such a we didn't know what we didn't miss. We didn't, we didn't miss, but we didn't know really. Most of us who, I mean, some of the girls who came from big cities, they would have wanted to go to big cities also. They did tell us we should try to live next to the capital or other large cities where we could have access to go to the theater and concerts and things like that. But we didn't really go any place from there. They had, in the winter time, we had skiing, we had to learn how to ski. In the summertime, we could go to to uh, boat rides. It was a nice place to be there. 
Was there an emphasis also on vocational education? Were they trying to teach people? It was too pay? short a time. I mean, in my case, I was there only about nine months, but most of the children didn't learn any kind of vocation there. There was no opportunity for it. They were trying to get us back to life a little bit, not to teach us what to do. They also had to supply us with places of work, not to go to work. Mm -hmm. Because once you turn 18 or 17 and a half and the school dissolved, you have to go and make a living for yourself. So the first time when the school was dissolving, they sent me and four other girls to work in a marmalade factory. And when the owners found out that we had tuberculosis. They sent us back to the school. Now the principal from there, they had to find a new job for us. Where could they find? And a tuberculosis hospital. So we, so they sent us to a tuberculosis hospital. And that was a profession. We had to, luckily I was not assigned to work on the, on the floor to change bed pens and sheets and such. But uh, I was assigned to work in the laboratory and in the outpatient department and the x-ray department and also in the operating room once a week. And I enjoyed that work, but I didn't have the education for anything to continue with getting a, de a degree. So I was thinking I'm going to go back to school and take physics and chemistry and mathematics and become a lab technician. But then I got sick. And things, <laughs> I wound up in a rehab and back in the hospital that I couldn't do, I couldn't really arrange for myself to have a profession. It was not my best years, my teenage years. And even later, I just didn't have an opportunity to really have, get a good education. I went to high school when I was, to, to high school in Sweden when I had, was feeling better. I wanted to go to Palestine but they didn't let me because I wasn't strong enough. Palestine needs healthy young people. It was a hard life, but I survived it. And I was very lucky to come to this wonderful country. And this is the best country in the world. And here I didn't have to work because when my husband married me, uh, he said he didn't want his wife to go to work anyway. He was <laughs> old, -fashioned, old fashioned European man. He said, my wife is going to be stay at home mom. And that's what they did for the first 10 years. Yeah, no, this is wonderful. And we're so, so glad you were able to join us today. Marlene, how was it handled with, uh, one last question, I know we have to end, but how, how was higher education handled in New Orleans? What was the idea about if people would go to college or get training, how was that funded or what opportunities were provided? It is fascinating. When the Newman School was founded, and again, the home in New Orleans was co-ed, most orphanages that I'm aware of, Jewish orphanages were, um, when the home founded the school so that its kids would be prepared for life. It was 1903. Every kid from the home started at Newman and went there till about seventh or eighth grade. But not every home kid, even though it was their school, continued through high school at Newman. It was so academically rigorous. By seventh or eighth grade, the, the headmaster of the school, who was technically employed by the home, and the home's board and the superintendent sat down, reviewed each kid, and with the kids' input, more as years went on, decided whether they should go to a public school, which by that time, by about 1920, 1320, um, there were already vocational schools that had emerged. And um, so, but for the kids who were interested and showed the, the ability, like Bessie and dozens and dozens and dozens of others, the home had scholarship funding and would try to help the kids. And many kids, I, I still don't have a final count, but there's a really good show, again, consistent with the numbers of the time of kids from the home who went on to school, to college. Almost every kid from the home who graduated from Newman was prepared for and probably went on to it, and for girls at least started college if they didn't finish. Um, and then, you know, many went on to perfect doctors, lawyers, and, you know, all sorts of things, including very successful business people. So, and in other cases, uh, inter people that I interviewed were thrilled that they shifted to a vocational tech program 
uh, one wonderful man, Harry Kovner, told me he couldn't have been happier because he really loved mechanical drafting. And it gave him the ability when he left Newman and had this wonderful, essentially Montessori, amazing lower school education. He was so well prepared. He got wonderful jobs and became his own independent plumbing contractor. Um, so, you know, the, the stories vary. We talked about how each child's experience or young adult's experience is so specific. And I'll just leave with one final note that my title, Most Fortunate Unfortunates, really is a question. You know, it is not assuming or belittling that these, this was on, this was a misfortune. But within that world, you know, how many were fortunate by their own account or, you know, compared to what else it could have been? Yeah, there's this idea of resilience. It's going to come up again. Um, so I encourage people who are interested uh, to attend the May 25th event and, and hear more about the Jewish orphan experience and enjoy some of that other research and scholarship. But I want to thank our guests, uh, Marlene and Ruth and Bernice. Thank you so much for these really wonderful presentations for this wonderful session. And thank you, Julie. Um, thanks to the Center for Jewish History for accommodating us and, and, and supporting the event. Thank you so much, Susan, for being a wonderful moderator and to our special guest, Ruth Mermelstein, for uh, giving your point of view and Marlene and Bernice, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank everybody. you.